Good afternoon again, everybody. We will resume the conference, and this panel is entitled Religion and the Environment. And I will introduce Abbot John in just a few moments, and the title of his presentation, as I mentioned earlier, is Benedictine, Benedictinism in the Environment. He will give his presentation, then I will give my presentation, and then I will come into the audience once again with the microphone, and all of you are more than welcome to ask Abbot John and or me your questions or raise points for discussion. It is an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce Abbot John Classen, who is the abbot of St. John's Abbey here in Collegeville. He's in his 23rd year, is leader of the Abbey. He leads a community of 100 Benedictine monks who sponsor and work at St. John's University, St. John's Preparatory School, the Liturgical Press, and other ministries in central Minnesota. He has long been interested in questions related to the nonviolent resolution of conflicts and was associated with the founding of the Peace Studies Program at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. Please join me in welcoming Abbot John Classen. Thank, thank you, John. Thank you so much. You're uh, welcome. And, and uh, thank you uh, uh, for, for being here this afternoon on a beautiful, sunny, warm afternoon. Um, I'd like to open my, my comments with a brief um, tribute to my beloved confrere, Father Rene McGraw who was so critical to the formation of the Peace Studies program. He died, uh, he was 87 years old, so he lived a full life. Um, died on November 20th, 2022. And, and he was a, uh, one of the founding members and inspiration for the Peace Studies program here at St. Ben's and St. John's. Of course, many faculty colleagues and students strongly supported that initiative and made it possible. Renee's interest in the nonviolent resolution of conflict was really transformed um, by a one-year sabbatical at Harvard University in the uh, late 70s and early 80s uh, under Professor Gene Sharp, who looked backwards to see where nonviolence and nonviolent strategies had in fact been successful at pushing back against and resisting oppression. We need to remember that the late 70s and early 80s were a time when the Soviet Union and the United States, between them, had 50,000 nuclear weapons. And we were in a launch on warning position in Europe at that time. There were so many nuclear warheads, the people who targeted them didn't have any place to use them all. It was that terrifying and that scary. As importantly, Rene, so I mean that's on a meta kind of absolutely huge level. Rene wanted us as communities to be aware of the practice of nonviolence in our everyday lives, the way we live with each other as human beings, as colleagues, with spouses and family members, in our businesses, in the way we relate to the creation itself. How does one go about understanding people and situations well enough to choose, consciously choose, a nonviolent response? How does one develop the courage, kind of the, the internal strength to uh, withstand and re speak out and resist evil? And to resist forces in the culture that want to take away or diminish our agency. Rene, I dare say, cultivated a profound skepticism of easy solutions, of grand promises. Uh, and I don't think it was just for the sake of being skeptical. I think it was Rene's realization of the many ways that human beings can find to go off the path and just not understand 
the significance of things. In our monastic community, Rene would often hear the challenge, and this is my, probably my unique contribution to the understanding of Rene. Uh, he would often hear the challenge from his brother monks, Rene, you're just too dark. Just too dark in his outlook. And that he needed to share some light, a pathway forward. Uh, of course, an easy Hollywood outcome was not worthy of true faith for him or for any of us. But Rene, I think, worked really hard and consistently to express genuine hope uh, for us, for the nations, for creation, and for the human project. And that hope for him as a monk and a priest was ultimately anchored in a deep personal faith in the risen Christ, which was nourished by prayer, by Eucharist, by the practice of silence, and by living in the middle of a community and communities uh, where love in the midst of failure is a daily goal, nevertheless, always. Uh, always we ask, you know, did, did we love each other uh, in all of this? And that, that's what provided the ultimate context for what he was trying to do in terms of peace studies. So, dear Rene, huh? So, I, I wanted to give a presentation on Benedict and monastic life the rule of St. Benedict, you'll recognize the work, huh? A short little rule. As, as a way for a community to live the gospel in a way that is responsive to the environment and respectful. Uh, I, I Actually, I wrote one talk and I uh, realized it was just way too formal for 10 minutes. So I said to myself, John, just use four words, okay? So, or four phrases. And the first one is the community of goods. The second is stability. The third is frugality. And the fourth is a contemplative stance. So those four phrases are what I'm going to talk to you. And they come right out of the heart of the rule of St. Benedict. A community of goods. How can we share things in our life together in such a way that we don't all have to be just really good consumers. If there's a way that we as human beings can live in a more nonviolent, non-destructive way in the environment, we have to stop being consumers. That means we need to learn how to take the link. <laughs> okay? We need to learn how to have an, a, an imagination for the place where we live in such a way that all of us are taking care of it. Whether it's picking up the trash uh, on the streets, on the floor, if it's making sure we don't throw trash everywhere. Uh, within the monastery, it's very hard. We, we, we have a community of goods, so we have a given number of cars. It's really hard to do that well. Why is that so? Because people have different senses of what it means to keep a car clean. Okay? How to, how to make sure there's gas in the tank. Um, how to make sure it gets repaired. I'm using this as a very simple example, but you can take it and spin it out in 20 different ways in the way in which you live right here, right now, every day. If we want to learn how to be nonviolent toward the creation, it begins with the care of our common home. Secondly, stability. Stability is a unique Benedictine commitment. It's, we are different from the Jesuits, and I love Jesuits, Dominicans, Franciscans, and other religious orders, in the sense that we make a commitment to live in a common, in, in, a, in a place for a long period of time. 
But what that means is, is that we, like good farmers, we want to hand this place on to the next generation in such a way that it is as good and as beautiful or more so than it was when we came into it. That, that commitment to stability then uh, is, is a way that we can make sure that we harvest oak trees, but that we also replant them and make sure that they survive. That we make sure that the water of where we live is not polluted. We have to be extremely careful with that. Um, or it means that we will try to, in every way possible, to reduce our carbon footprint. So we just voted as a community, uh, and, as a, and when I say community, I mean all of St. John's, uh, to do cogeneration. We have been doing in the powerhouse cogeneration since 1946. And that means using high pressure steam to drive turbines, which produce 25% of the electricity that we use on the campus. Those generators uh, were, were uh, unwittingly destroyed when a, a, a backup system didn't work a few years ago. But we are going to put in a new cogeneration system to produce between 25 and 50% of the electrical demand on the campus. It will pay back, but it's, it's again, it's looking ahead to do that kind of uh, that kind of analysis and investment in the future. Thirdly, frugality. It's not a nice word. It has a pinched feeling about it. You might think, you're going to stop being hospitable, are you? Nothing could be further from the truth. But what it does mean is, is we are going to avoid wasting resources. We're going to use what we've been given extremely carefully. If you sit with us in our dining room, our monastic dining room, we have some beautiful oak tables that were made in the 1920s. They're about 40 inches wide and about eight feet long, and they're strong enough that you could butcher a cow on them. Beautiful wood. And if you look at them, you'll see just a small little square in some places. And it's obvious that there's been a wooden insert and you say, what the heck is that? Well, they didn't, there was a knot there. And the woodworker said, I'm not going to throw away this whole plank just so that I can have a board that doesn't have a knot. And so they put this little insert in there, and it fits absolutely perfectly. We call them Huberts. They're named after Brother Hubert who was a master woodworker for about 40 years in Abbey Woodworking. That's an example of frugality. And that is, we're not going to take this beautiful piece of wood because we have an inflated sense of perfectionism, but we're going to use it the way it is. There are countless other examples I could give, but that, that would do it. Some monks get carried away on this. Uh, so that, uh, shall we say, those who wash our t-shirts finally have to say, okay, this has had a thousand washes and about five too many, and it's going, because there's nothing left, okay? <laughs> but it means using things until they're worn out, not using things and then throwing them away. Pope Francis and many others have talked about a throwaway culture. Quote opposite, God forbid. Finally, finally, and I'll stop. A single important dimension of monastic life is a contemplative stance toward our life, toward each other, toward the world we live in. It's, it's stopping long enough to actually see each other, to see the woods, the lake, to listen to the birds, to, to feel what's happening with our bodies, to feel, to re, when we read a text, to
to feel and hear the text, the words. What do they sound like when we speak them? So that we can, in fact, understand them. When we're, when we're, looking, when we're looking at, a, at, at a, 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 a tree or a pathway, that we're aware of it. It's, it's the ability to sit long enough to be actually engaged with the creation and each other. Truly, it is transformative to not go through life as if we're simply always on a Shinkansen train, a speeding bullet train. So four things, a community of goods, stability, frugality, and a contemplative stance. Thank you. John, thank you. So I am John Armajani, and the title of my presentation is Islam and the Environment. I am professor of peace studies at St. Ben St. John's and teach courses related to peace studies, theology, and Islam and Christianity. The focus of this presentation is on Islam and the environment. Specifically, this presentation will emphasize the aspects of Islam which obligate all humans to protect the environment. Before delving into Islam and the environment, I would like to provide some brief background about Islam. While the name of the religion is Islam, the adherents of that religion are Muslims. Muslims believe that Islam originated in the year 610 AD when the prophet Muhammad began receiving messages from God through the angel Gabriel. And those messages are called revelations. These messages which Muhammad received in the language of Arabic came to him periodically until before his passing in 632 AD. These messages or revelations are written in the Quran, all of which is in Arabic. And um, Muslims believe that the Quran contains the actual words of God and is a perfect sacred text. The Quran functions in a somewhat similar way in Islam as the Bible does in Christianity. In both Islam and Christianity, adherents of those religions believe that their respective sacred texts carry messages from God and constitute the foundations of their respective religions. Indeed, the Quran, like the Bible, contains many verses that call on all humans, including Muslims, to care for the earth and its resources. In addition, according to Muslims, the prophet Muhammad, the most important role model for Muslims, also taught Muslims about the importance of caring for the environment. An important Islamic principle related to humans' responsibility for caring for the environment is the following. God created everything in the universe, including the earth and humans, and God gave humans a responsibility for caring for the earth and everything else that God created. According to many Muslims, Humans have the obligation of doing whatever may be necessary to care for the environment. Along these lines, I will quote some verses from the Quran and explain the ways that Muslims believe that they call on human beings to care for the environment. Quran chapter 2, verse 60 states, quote, And do not commit abuse on the earth, spreading corruption, unquote. For Muslims, this verse makes significant connections among the Islamic concepts of human sin, greed, corruption, and the possibility of harming the earth as a result of these tendencies. Indeed, selfishness is one reason that humans exploit the environment, sometimes for their own greedy purposes. This Quranic passage reminds all persons, including Muslims, to rely on God to enable them to block their self-centered inclinations and focus on the results of their positive actions in such a way that they will protect the environment. Quran chapter 6, verse 99 states, quote, And it is God who sends down water from the sky. With it we produce vegetation of all kinds, from which we bring greenery, from which we produce grain and clusters, and palm trees with hanging clusters, and vineyards, and olives, and pomegranates. Watch their fruits as they grow and ripen. Surely in this are signs for people who believe, unquote. For Muslims, 
This verse discusses God's all-powerful and all-giving, life-giving nature. One manifestation of God's omnipotence is his ability to imbue life on creation. In this passage, the forms of life with which God has endowed the earth include greenery, vegetation of all kinds, grains, and so on. While God has created all forms of life, God sustains them in many ways, which include sending water from the sky to nurture them. Yet for many Muslims, humans have a crucial role in the sustenance of life. In that this verse states, quote, surely in this are signs for people who believe, unquote. For Muslims, there are at least two aspects to those signs. One is that God is the world's creator. Second is that humans should look upon God's example of sustaining the environment and do so themselves. Quran chapter 22, verse 32 states that God, quote, made the sky a protected ceiling, yet the unbelievers turn away from its wonders, unquote. Some Muslims view the protected ceiling as the ozone layer and interpret this passage as placing an obligation on humans to protect that ozone layer. Along these lines, some Muslims believe that the Quran reminds humans that God cares for them by creating the world with the ozone layer to protect humans from ultraviolet radiation that can harm humans and other organisms. Yet from a Muslim perspective, God knows that if humans are not careful, they may destroy the ozone layer. In this context, this Quranic verse reminds humans that they need to protect the ozone layer and God's creation in order to protect themselves and the rest of God's creation. In connection with these ideas, the contemporary Muslim environmentalist Ibrahim Abdul Matin emphasizes six core principles for Islamic environmentalism in his timely book entitled Green Deen, What Islam Teaches About Protecting the Environment. Deen in Arabic means religion, and the reference here is to Islam. These six principles involve one, Understanding the oneness of God and his creation. Two, seeing signs of God everywhere. Three, being a steward of the earth. Four, honoring the covenant or trust humans have with God to be protectors of the planet. Five, moving toward justice. And six, living in balance with nature. In order to show that his ideas are firmly rooted in the original Arabic version of the Quran, Abdul Matin includes in his book, key Quranic words in the original Arabic next to the corresponding English translations. These Arabic words include the words Tawheed for God's oneness, Ayat for God's signs, Khalifa for human stewardship of God's creation, Amana for the trusting relationship between God and humans, Adil for God's justice, and Mizan for the balance between humans and nature. Abdul Matin builds on these and related Islamic concepts in his book as he discusses from an Islamic perspective the problems of overconsumption, the environmental movement as a response to overconsumption, and problems related to overuse of energy, water, and food resources. With respect to overconsumption, for example, Abdul Matin believes that a starting point for being aware of one's overconsumption begins with prayer which Muslims must do five times per day. While prayer strengthens Muslims' bonds with God and each other, environmentally conscious Muslims can also utilize prayer to continually make themselves aware um, of their own consumption and ways to limit it in a manner that is as disciplined and humble as their spiritual state when they pray. With respect to the environmental movement as a response to overconsumption, Abdul Matin suggests that there is significant overlap between some of the principles of Islamic environmentalism on the one hand and some principles of secular or non-religious environmentalism on the other. For example, Islamic and secular environmentalists both believe in the importance of human solidarity um, as they try to focus on ways to limit overconsumption. With respect to the environmental movement as a response to overconsumption, Abdul Mant suggests that there is significant overlap. Oh, right, and so I already said that. Muslims and secular environmentalists also believe in the importance of human responsibility and stewardship, of nurturing trusting relationships between persons as they can work together to protect the environment, 
of fostering justice and maintaining a balance between humans and nature. For Abdul Mahan, Muslims can maintain the strength of their Islamic faith while working alongside non-Muslim allies in establishing and perpetuating environmental protection and justice. Within this context, Abdul Mahan states that Muslims and others who are involved in the struggle for environmental protection and justice must be aware of the harm that colonialism has done to the environment. The negative effects of colonialism are particularly important with respect to Muslims because many majority Muslim countries were colonized. The colonial powers used several methods including forms of domination that were political, economic, military, social, cultural, and linguistic in perpetuating colonialism while harming the environment in the process. While some believe that the colonial period has ended, Abdul Mahan argues that many forces that the colonial powers use to perpetuate their power continue to harm the environment. Abdul Mahan believes that if Muslims stay true to their Islamic principles and act in partnership with their Muslim and non-Muslim allies, they can reduce and possibly correct the harms which colonialism and its effects have had on the environment. In light of all these ideas, Islam obligates Muslims to protect the environment while providing them with an ethical framework to enact ideas related to environmental activism. At the same time, environmentalists, Muslims, and Christians may be natural allies in the struggles to protect the environment because their religions have many pro-environmental ethical concepts. These ethical concepts within Islam and Christianity include God as creator of the universe, humans as stewards of the environment, prayer as spiritually nurturing, in the environmental struggle, and justice and peace as goals that can motivate their religious and political partnerships. According to John's Gospel in the Christian Bible, Jesus is believed to have said, quote, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, unquote. Similarly, the Quran states, quote, As for those who believe and do good works, God will guide them through their faith. Rivers will run beneath their feet in the gardens of bliss. Their prayer will be glory to you, O God, and their greeting to one another, peace, unquote. Shared concepts of peace can form a basis for allies who work toward environmental justice. With these ideas in mind, and in the spirit of this conference, I would like to pay tribute to Father René McGraw. Father René had a profound influence on my professional life in many ways, including through the conversations that we had about the relationships among peace studies, theology, and religion. One of the early conversations that we had was during the 1997-98 academic year when I was a resident scholar at the Collegeville Institute at St. John's University where I was writing my PhD dissertation and doing research for it. At a gathering of members of the St. Ben St. John's community, which included resident scholars from the Institute, Father Rene and I conversed about Iran's Islamic Revolution in 1979, which overthrew that country's secular government and Iran's king, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, and brought to power Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini and Iran's Islamic government. When I shared with Father Rene the idea that the Islamic Revolution in Iran was largely nonviolent, he asked me whether the revolution's leaders intended the revolution to be nonviolent. I responded yes and explained the reasons for that based on the revolutionaries' interpretations of Islam's sacred texts. That conversation caused me to teach my courses and conduct my research with even greater focus on the relationships between nonviolence and violence on the one hand and religious and political ideas in Islam and Christianity on the other. Father Rene's ideas about the relationships among theology, religion, and peace studies continued to inspire me as I taught my courses and as I wrote several publications on violence, nonviolence, Christianity, and Islam. At the same time, his enormous support of my courses and scholarship on Islam and Christianity and his scholarly expertise on environmental justice catalyzed the writing of this conference paper. I am deeply grateful to Father Rene for everything that he did for me professionally and personally. In Father Rene's memory, I will conclude with a verse from the Christian Bible and the book of Revelation. That is the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 4, verse I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, which states, quote, 
Blessed are the deceased who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So I will go to my other microphone, and I will pick it up, turn it on, and then open the floor for questions. Okay, so please just give me a few seconds until I move over to the left side of the table. Testing, testing. Thank you, Dr. Compton. Okay, I appreciate you doing that. Thanks a lot. Questions, comments, observations. Here, I see you, Lincoln. <laughs> so, um, I, in the, I believe last year, did some um, research for a book I read um, titled. It was by, I can't even remember her name. She's a, she's a graphic novelist, um, a Muslim a woman who uh, writes about her time in Iran um, and also draws because it's a graphic novel. Um, the interesting part about what you said for me was I, her perspective was that it started off nonviolent and ended up uh, enforcing uh, more and more in a militaristic um, style of government. So I, I wonder how um, the teachings of the Quran uh, relate to that, and if they diverged from that, or perhaps changed their views in some way. And I just wanted to hear your opinion on that, uh, because I think it's interesting. Thank, thank you for the question. In my opinion, one of the similarities, among others, between the Bible and the Quran is that both of those sacred texts have some verses that honor peace and espouse peace and support peace in a whole number of ways. At the very same time, in the sacred texts of both of, the, of, both of those religions, there are sacred texts uh, or verses within the, those sacred texts that call for violence under certain circumstances. So those two types of verses live very much in tension with each other, as they do within the religious worldviews of the religions. So while Iranians were protesting <clears throat> um, the rule of Iran's king in, in 1978 and 1979, um, they intentionally use nonviolent means in terms of demonstrations and boycotts and a whole um, other series of nonviolent tactics in order to try to overthrow the government. So in those early stages of the revolution, um, the, the revolution was nonviolent. Then after um, the Islamic government took power. Unfortunately, matters in the country, especially with respect to the government, took a very different turn. As the, as the people who governed the country, both Ayatollah Khomeini and himself and the people under him, they began to feel that they had a responsibility to invoke and enforce a very specific type of Islamic ideological purity and a very specific type of Islamic political purity. And for those revolutionary leaders, Islam and politics were utterly fused. So, um, so within that context, Iran's Islamic government basically stated, and this is something that's been the case ever since the Islamic government has come into existence, that the enemies of the state are the enemies of Islam. And the punishments that the Quran, and it's another one of Islam's very important sacred texts, the Hadith, spell out for the opponents or adversaries of Islam, which can be qu quite brutal, are 
the types of punishments that have to be meted out against the enemies of Islam. So, I mean, this was a, there was no way that in a 15-minute presentation I could go into all this. I, I was just trying to focus on the one very, I mean, I've had many, many positive memories of Father Rene, but that was one of the things I wanted to sort of talk about in terms of how it prompted my own thinking. So your question is very sophisticated. There's, there's, no, there's no doubt about that whatsoever. Yet these are some dimensions of my answer to it. Do you have a follow-up question or any comments? No? OK, thank you. Other questions or comments? I got a couple. Oh, was there one? I'm sorry. Oh, yes. When you're holding the microphone, you have to ask a question if no one else has a question, but I'm happy to give it away. Well, actually, I was going to ask this question of you, and we ran out of time, so maybe I'll make it for all three of you. But my question, this, these issues of environment and climate change um, can be very dark and depressing. And so I'd like to ask each of you if you could address the question, what gives you hope for the success of environmental peace building? I mean, why try to do it? Why care about it? Why hope that this can work and give us the beautiful world we want to live in? I think John wants me to start. Yeah, you look like, you, you look like you're right to respond. So I mean, in I some ways, that was. That was going to be part of my question as well. So I'm, I, you know, um, I guess I would say two things. Just, I mean, that's a very deep and profound question, and, and something that I wrestle with all the time. Just very quickly, two things. I was glad that Abidjan mentioned the Cold War, and when he's talking about Father Rene and so on. I took a class in international relations when I was an undergraduate in 1981, cool. at the height of the Cold War. And the best image that the professor could give us for hope was that if the United States and the Soviet Union didn't blow each other up, maybe in 50 or 60 years, they could converge on something that looked uh, like Sweden, right? Soviet collectivism without the gulag, American freedom without, you know, with a little more social democracy, et cetera. That was the best image. Eight years later, the Berlin Wall came down and it was a real lesson to me to not make judgments about the future that were going to that would demobilize me. I think a lot of times when we get into that discouragement and depression it, it's not that it's wrong but it's 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 it, it's more about us than it is about the I don't have the calculus to add up whether the world is trending in positive or negative directions and so on. So that's the first thing. It, I, I just try to remind myself that a lot of it is about me and how I'm feeling and processing this rather than some objective assessment of the state of affairs. And the second thing is, if the people I was talking about haven't quit on these issues, what right do I have as a super privileged person you know, to quit and to abdicate my sort of responsibility? And so I'll quit when they quit it and not until. It's, it's one of those things that, that uh, uh, we, we've come through, and, and it, 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 I'm sure it's the thing that happens uh, many, many times in the course of human history, and that is, is there are voices over here that for years and years and years have ferociously denied <laughs> climate change and, and, and the role that human beings have in contributing to uh, climate change and environmental degradation, okay? And now we are in risk of that swinging all the way to the other side to climate doom. That is, there's nothing we can do. You know? And so precisely to your question, and that is, how do we find a position in the middle here where, in fact, we are able to understand our situation as best as we can and do those things today, uh, whether it's studying, but also community action. Institutionally, I feel a huge burden as Abbott at St. John's to, to guide and work with others institutionally that align us with a vision for uh, caring for our place. 
Um, as part of that, uh, there's also, so the one thing you can't call into question right now is market economics. Even though market economics, given their free reign, are the surest path toward environmental destruction. So one of the things we have to do here is in the middle here is to think about how economics has to work going forward to include the people that you describe so well, Ken, in, in the poorest of the poor, but also in our own country. And there's a reason that those situations happen again and again and again. Uh, and, and the third source of my hope, of course, is, uh, and, and this is, our Earth is a part of a much larger cosmos. And so when I think about hope for the future, I, I have to think beyond, for myself, this Earth. Uh, and it doesn't mean that I, I'm looking for a ticket to Mars, I'm not. But it means that, that the cosmos itself will not fail. Well, I certainly understand that there are reasons for despair. I think that simultaneous with that, in addition to um, the statements that Dr. Kanka and Abbott John made, I, I think there's some additional ideas. I mean, I found myself feeling hopeful when I listened to Dr. Kanka's presentation and these grassroots groups among the Palestinians and Israelis, among some Nigerians and um, some of the in, one or more indigenous groups in Brazil. And, they're, and I would imagine that they are emblematic and representative of other groups, both within those regions and other parts of the world that are involved in positive ways in the environmental struggle. And there are even certain simple examples that can be multiplied. For instance, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when there was such a thing as leaded gas. Unleaded gas was not an option. And then catalytic converters became required of all automobiles in the United States. And there are various states and localities in the United States that have emission tests, like metropolitan Chicago and the smog test in California, et cetera. So there's more to protecting the environment than catalytic converters. I, I understand. And there's more to protecting the environment than removing lead from paint. Believe me, I understand. But I think there's a level of awareness about the environment, even among people who want very lax or no environmental regulations. There's a consciousness about it that exists now that may not have existed 50 years ago. And in my very subjective opinion, my students over at least the past 10 to 15 years are thinking and talking a lot more about the environment than people were in my generation, although there, even when I was in college, people were talking about it. But the level of intensity and focus on it seems greater now. Those are some ideas I'd like to share. Thank you. There's actually a school of economic thought that says that the, those car inspections are a waste of time because they draw people away from labor. And if you look at the hourly wage that those people are paid and the productivism that they could be engaged in, think about that for a moment. Think about Father John's comments about our community of goods. Rather than viewing that act of making sure that your car is being a responsible member of the community as a virtuous act and a contribution to the community of goods, the people are being, the drivers are being constructed simply as sort of homo economicus, right? These producing agents that have no other kind of existence other than to produce and to consume and that therefore that, that regulation should actually be sort of eliminated. I think that example you know, the, the comments of the two of you, I think, are joined by that 
response, and it, it really just doubled down on that with John's comment about market economics, which I couldn't agree with more. Uh, other questions or comments? Sorry, just had to get that in there. Well, thank you both, uh, Abba John and Dr. Ramajani. Um, and, and thank you also, Dr. Kanka. Yeah, I really appreciated everything I've heard so far. Um, see you. Um, they, I, I was told before that they have to catch a bus back to St. John's. <laughs> yes. Um, so um, I'm very grateful that, uh, Abbot John, you pointed out um, how Benedictine life is a source of caring for our common home, as, as Pope Francis called it, for our earth. And, um, and John, you know, how you pointed out that there are sources within Islam, within Islamic scriptures and interpretations uh, that are fruitful for the environment as well. And yet, there's an awful lot of religious people, Christians and Muslims and others, um, who think, in fact, that all this talk about climate change is actually non-religious, even if you're drawing on religious sources. They, they think you and I and all of us here who um, in the name of religion, you know, address climate uh, issues are somehow not real believers because, you know, um, it, we're, we're not relying on God, for example. It all has to do with images of God, of course, right? But how do you respond to certain groups of religious people, fundamentalists, uh, you know, who will say that uh, concern about uh, climate change is actually, you know, infidelity somehow to God. Uh, great, great question, John. Uh, so I was, I was with some good friends, local farmers uh, who are, uh, have a, uh, a winter home, one of these trailer homes out in Mesa, Arizona, okay? So I'm a uh, great community. These are wonderful people, okay? But we were, we just, our conversation a winter ago huh, uh, lapsed into, shall we say, uh, discussion of the climate uh, and, and climate change and human sources for that change, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I, I could feel, I could feel the resistance shooting up toward the ceiling <laughs> as, that, as my comments went on. And I realized, oh my goodness. Um, and these are thoughtful people. Are uh, the Roman Catholics uh, in, in that group, okay? But they simply look at uh, what we're experiencing around the earth as just part of the normal ebb and flow of, and cycle of drought and warmth and cold, etc. And it's just nature across the long span of human history. And, and I realized in that moment, and this is not answering your question at all, that I was not going to convince them of, of my position. I could simply speak about, from a scientific point of view, the reasons why we believe First of all, that the climate is changing. And secondly, that human beings do have a role in that. But it's a hard, as you, as you know uh, from your own work, uh, it was a hard road to hoe and will be going forward. Maybe it's not possible to convince them of climate change. I wonder whether it may be possible to convince them of things that do harm the environment. Like water pollution and air pollution and carcinogens 
and a whole host of other things that can cause people to be harmed in one way or another. I wonder whether they would accept scientific evidence about those things. I don't, I don't know, but it, it does strike me as unusual to, for someone to say that um, somehow standing up for God's creation uh, is, is, constitutes infidelity to God. And one last thing that I'm going to say, and I know this is not going to sound altogether positive, but there are some people, whether they're religious or not, who are so convinced of their position that, that they're just not going to listen to what anyone who differs from them is going to say anyway. Those are a few things that I have in mind in terms of my response. So it's 3 o'clock. This panel ends at 3.05. It seems we may have time for one more question. Is that, Dr. Conker, does that seem sure. about right to you? Sure, Josh, so OK, yes. let's, let's see if there's Questions one more question. Questions or comments? Anybody? OK, so I, I'll, conc I'll conclude this particular session. So um, Abbott John, thank you for your presentation and your responses to the questions. I thank all of you for being here, and I thank all the questioners for your questions. So our final panel will begin at 3.20, again, in this room. It will last until 4.15. The theme of that panel is environmental justice. Um, Dr. Ted Gordon will share some ideas about Native Americans, uh, Indigenous Americans, and the environment. Dr. Derek Larson will give a presentation entitled Global Environmental Justice. So please stay, and I really look forward to our reconvening the conference at 320. Yep. 320. 320. 320 to 415.